10 years ago, 60 years old, I knew that my passion for pastoring was coming to an end. And it's not that I didn't enjoy pastoring. It has its ups and downs, its challenges. But overall, the majority of my time pastoring was a pure joy because I love people. I love God's people. I love God's church. I love his word. But I knew that my passion was waning because I didn't want to keep doing something that he wasn't assigning me to do. So I had to go on a sabbatical and say, God, what now am I supposed to look forward to? He said, discipleship is missing in action. It's missing in the church. It's not happening according to the Jesus model. I'm raising up generals throughout this land. That's why I'm glad so many of you had mentioned this is just one way. In the back of my um, Discover Discipleship book, I have a list of all the different organizations that God has just raised up in the last 10 years because he told me, you're going to start hearing this word more and more and more, discipleship. But they don't understand what that really means. So we need to help them understand. We need to help us learn and understand what discipleship really means. And uh, Angel, you presented and demonstrated that so well today in your message. I love that, that it is practice theology. It is getting in people's lives. And it is, it's, it's that, that beautiful statement. Love God, love others, make disciples. So that's what he told me to do. I had no idea that this would be the end result. Not at all. I just took one day at a time, one week at a time, writing as the Lord is leading me, and therefore saying, okay, am I finished? No, not yet. <laughs> so by the time I got done with all six of those books, I knew we needed to have a ramp, a, a, a kind of an on-ramp that was a little bit less intimidating. So I wrote the Discover Discipleship book for a four-week on-ramp so that you could start filtering through the people that will not really be serious as serious. Or let's say, let me just be uh, a little on the gent gentler side with more grace. Not everybody gets it. It is a revelation. It needs to be revealed to you by the Holy Spirit that you need a systematic approach to digging deeper into God. And this is just one way it can be done. But at the end of the day, it's all about what is it systematically you are intentionally doing to get yourself in the word every day and feed yourself. The intention of every pastor, if you were to ask them, if you were to inventory them, it was always my heart and desire to see everybody a word person, everybody in the word. I just didn't know how to get them there. And I knew that just preaching a good word or teaching a good word wasn't going to put them in the word, wasn't going to help them become accountable and intentional, intentional in doing it. So this is the format he gave me. So I thought this could, and I love the word apprenticeship. Was it you that brought that out, the word apprenticeship? Yes. I loved how he was using that phrase because it is an ongoing apprenticeship. And that's just the foundation. So... That was written. Then I realized that people getting saved now, we need an on-ramp for them. So I wrote, now that you're saved, what happens next? Because I, I continue to see the, the hundreds and hundreds of people in the mega churches going forward and getting saved and then getting water baptized. And I, I'm wondering in my heart, who's following up on that person? Who's bringing them into their, under their wing, and then discipling them? Or are they just being handed a card, checked off the box, you're now saved, but Jesus is nowhere near being Lord of their lives because no one's showing them how to make them Lord. So when I was in China, I needed to write this book because I saw in the church there, people were coming forward at the services, but because of the big brother heavy-handed thing, and there was an underground church, they were going off with nothing in their hands other than a prayer card and not being discipled or not really knowing what they signed up for. And that is a country that has um, gods that they serve and that they worship, and you don't realize that, but there is, you know, all kinds of different religious kind of gods. 
And so I needed to make sure that they at least got the fact that Jesus is God above all gods. But just one very simple thing. But I knew people need to know what they're signing up for. And I wrote that book more with the intent to talk people out of being saved from the standpoint of showing them how you really know if you are and really challenging them on their commitment or their prayer to Jesus. Were you really serious? Did you really mean you were committing? Do you know what that means to make Jesus your Savior and Lord? Because you just don't get that hearing a, an invitation and coming forward, most people are clueless as to why they're coming forward. A lot of it has to do with a conviction in the moment by the Holy Spirit and a friend saying, hey, you want to go forward? And then they come forward and they're crying and they're emotional and they know that they're sinners. But it just doesn't stop there. You don't drop the baby at the door and not raise them. So they need to know that. The next being water baptized. P people get saved and immediately water baptized, but they wonder what in the world for? I know this is symbolic, but what is happening in it actually? And so I knew that needed to be written and then baptized with fire. I do not make any um, excuses or um, what's the word? When you get my age, you start losing words you used to know. Um, I was not going to back down from this being part of the foundation, that tripod. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was in the early church. It never ceased. It's always been there for us to have and to receive. And it's, it's a way that God can empower us to move forward in not only opening up the word and understanding and grasping it, but also to be bold in our faith. So we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And people are intimidated by it. Or they've been in a church that, with the, you know, people were doing the holy rolling thing and everybody's speaking in tongues and they look at everybody and say, are you not mad here? Well, Paul addressed that in 1 Corinthians 14. And so we need to help people understand that's an easy thing to do. It's as easy as letting someone baptize you in water. You can easily get this. So I just knew by my own experience that I needed to help people understand it theologically and practically and how to lead someone into that as well as the water baptism. Because as a disciple and you're growing, you're going to start bringing people into the Lord. And I want you to be able to take them through the three basics. Read one book at a time. And you can lead someone into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was just talking uh, to someone at lunch who said, oh, I know when I got it was really cool, but when I got to see someone else get it, oh, that was just the best day. And I said, yeah, isn't it fun to see someone get baptized in the Holy Spirit? Tamara, where are you? Tamara, her friend Ebony, um, when was that, last year? Um, so the, the uh, our pastor gave a, a call to those who want to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so he called some of us up to help them. And I, I came up, and Ebony was here. And, man, she got hit so hard. And she was speaking in tongues, and it just rocked her world. But here was the, here was the amazing thing about it. And this doesn't happen to everybody, but she couldn't stop speaking in tongues. Her daughter tried talking to her, and she couldn't talk to her in English. She, as soon as she opened her mouth to try to talk to someone in English, she just kept speaking in tongues. And that, how long did that last? Three hours. Three hours. She could not speak in English. She could only speak in tongues. She wanted to speak in English, but she couldn't. <laughs> but um, that just wrecked her life. And so then Tamara wound up getting it. <laughs> and it's just that, that flow. So I wanted people to have a tool to be able to lead someone into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, write the re so the resources are there for you as a disciple. This is what this is all about, resource. So I have all those done, but the Lord would not let me rest because getting a new convert from day one of conversion to jump into discover discipleship, that's kind of a leap, right? I mean, they're clueless. They're coming into the kingdom of God, don't understand the kingdom language, don't understand the kingdom culture. They don't even know. Uh, I mean, they just know nothing theologically. 
So they have no context in which to really grasp everything that's coming, even though it has been mentioned. You can, yes, take a brand new believer into, in through book one, and, and I did try to write it that way because I didn't have these others in view at the time. But I began to notice as time progressed that's, that it intimidates a lot of people thinking about going through or committing to six months, 26 weeks of a weekly study because a lot of people just aren't in a study mode. Once they're out of college, I'm not in a study mode anymore. I'm more in a receiving mode. Let me watch TV. Let me do this. Let me hear a sermon. But study, that's a, like a rehabituating something that had been dehabituated. So now we're kind of at a place where a new convert needs a bridge between getting saved and discover discipleship. So that's why God had me write the Christian Believer's Handbook. Now, initially, I, I wrote it to be uh, titled it the New Believer's Handbook. And Jim Xavier designed this cover for me. And that's why you got the little heart there. And it was the New Believer's Handbook. But then David Brown said, man, this is, this is too good for just new believers. You need to, this, all the believers need to hear this book, need to read this book. So he said, this should be Christian Believer's Handbook. And I thought about that in a moment. I said, you know, this is right. Because a lot of Christians did not get a good solid foundation in their new conversion. A lot of Christians had holes and cracks and caves in part of their foundation. When I was in high school, our teacher was teaching us uh, working with clay on the potter's wheel. And you had to, you know, so you pull the big lump of clay out of the plastic and you unwrap it. And then you start kneading it. But before you do all that, before it even hits the wheel, you have to take um, string and cut through it and look for the bubbles. Because the purpose of the kneading is to knead out all the bubbles Otherwise, it will explode in the kiln when the heat rises. Recently, we've all been, you know, just horrified by the tragic event of the Surfside condos, right? If you haven't heard about it, it was a condominium in Florida on the beach that had, from the top, started crashing down floor upon floor upon floor upon floor because the foundation gave way. There had been an inspection not long before saying uh, of the foundation and pictures were taken and there were all these cracks and there were leaks of uh, uh, water coming in and, and so on and so forth. And they warned somebody, whoever needed to be warned, saying, you got to fix these cracks. This is unsafe. The foundation is not solid. And it didn't get to it. They didn't get to it. And so people were asleep in their beds, not knowing that the last, they were breathing their last, uh, you know, awake breath and going to not wake up the next day. So boom, 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 people in their beds. Pressure, wait, 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 because there were holes and there were cracks in the foundation. There are Christians today who are asleep in their Christian walk, not realizing how weak and full of cracks their foundation is. So when the storms really start blowing and the heat really starts turning up, they'll either explode or they'll be crushed by the weight of what's coming because they have not built their house on a rock. It's been built on sand. That's why so many people are swallowing, so many Christians are swallowing the critical theory that Joseph was talking about. So many people are swallowing that God is love and God is good, but he's not going to send you to hell. He's not going to, God does not punish people. And I understand that thinking, but it is false theology. And Christians are buying it because they don't have a good foundation of understanding the nature of who God really is. That he is, as Joseph said, other than. He is not like any of us. 
Yes, we are made with the imprint of his image, but we are created. He is not. So I want to um, share with you a moment about this Christian Believer's Handbook. Oh, before I go there, let me go back. Go back. Okay. Some ask me, okay, Jay, how does this work now? If I'm going to start a group, do I start with Discover Discipleship and then these? Or what? Uh, do I go back to this? So if I, going forward, this is my recommendation. Now, you, just, you do what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. Not every case is the same. It's up to how you feel the Lord is leading. But my recommendation is new convert is starting with the first book. Help them understand what they've signed up for. And then if they agree and, and now grasp that, then take them into water baptism and water baptize them. You don't have to wait for the church to have their annual baptism service. I'm not saying anything's wrong with that. I'm just saying I see a pattern in the book of Acts that they were immediately baptized in water. Get that foundation laid quick. And then they were led into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, Get, those, get that trod pad, those three legs laid first. Then now take them into the Christian Believer's Handbook. Now, if it's someone that's already been saved and you want to start them in the Discipleship Group series, it's only three months. I say take them into this one because we don't know what the foundation of that Christian looks like. We can't assume that all of the holes and the cracks have been shored up and fixed. And so it's best to look at this as a primer or let's say a refreshing refresher course for their foundation to examine what their foundation looks like. As for an un, a, a new believer, we're giving them a brand new look. I asked the Lord because he wanted me to do this. I didn't know how long it was going to be, but I just started writing down the subjects of what needed to take place. From a new believer standpoint, and I will be in January, I think I'll be 49 years old in the Lord, almost a half a century. Isn't that crazy? I'm, I'm really coming, getting close to my Pentecost. <laughs> so, as a new believer, knowing what I know now, what, would I, what do I wish I would have known when I first got saved? And so I just began writing down the subjects, just the subjects. These that I'm showing you here, and I'll, I'll approach in a minute, those are the topics, the topics with sub, sub subjects underneath. And so this is what I came up with, and these are the 12 categories I came up with. The kingdom of God, the Bible, God's nature and attributes, salvation, the cross of Christ, the church, spiritual disciplines, the sacraments, which are only two in the Bible, the Christian walk, the eternal states, discipleship, and then building your library. So I now began, what I did is I just said, the Lord would show me, and I'm reading, I'm doing my devotions, I'm in the Word, and I'm writing down. I've got, I do a, I'm kind of a post-it guy, right? I'm posting it, I mean, uh, post-its, and I've got them all over the place, and I've got stacks and stacks of, okay, this is my category <laughs> over here of the subjects I'm going to cover in this book. So I, w I believe the Lord was leading me. I said, this needs to be in that book. And this needs. So before I know it, I've got 100 and plus subjects. And I'm thinking, well, now that's going to take a while to write. <laughs> but this is what the Lord wanted me to do. I then took the subjects and put them in these categories. And... Um, and so then realized how I need to format this. I didn't want to format it like the discipleship program. I wanted to format it as a one page. One page like a devotional and three or four scriptures to look up in corresponding with that subject, with that topic. And so this is what it came up with. And I believed that this, of all the books I've written, was going to be the most critical and most important piece of this entire system and process. So this, is, this just came out, and Jesus said, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is, like, is a wise 
like a person who builds a house on solid rock, though the rain comes and torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. So I'm a builder. My dad was a carpenter. He taught me how to build. I, I watched him. My uncle, my mom's brother was a builder. I worked for him. I built my own house. Uh, GC'd that, the general contracted that. So I understand that any building, any tall tower, the taller the building, the deeper the foundation has to be. And you have to lay the bedrock, the concrete footing has to be poured with rebar going through it and it has to be inspected before you pour the concrete because the inspector wants to make sure it's deep enough to handle the weight and the pressure of the house that's going to be sitting on top of it and all that block and all that material. And so that is the most important piece for that house and it's the first thing that's laid before you build. So if we're going to build a house that's going to last and going to last in the end times, if we are in the end times, then we need to have a foundation that's not going to be crushed under the storm of the political storm that's coming, of the agenda of Marxism that's coming, of the agenda of whatever is coming, especially when the, if the Antichrist arises in our lifetime. Now, I, I don't know if he will, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but all I know is if we're going to be making disciples, we got to start them off with as solid a foundation as possible. That's what this book now is about. And it's 12 weeks. It's only 12 weeks. And it's getting them in a rhythm of being in the word every day. So day one, you do this. Then you do this. Then you do this. And it's a devotional style. But I'm giving you a synthesized version in one page of the most essential doctrines that the Bible uh, brings out for foundation. So I start out with a kingdom of God. I don't notice the church is a six one down. Now, being a pastor, I probably would have started with a church. No, the church is the outpost of the kingdom. And most people in Western Christianity don't realize that it's not coming into the church community. It's not coming into the Sunday morning service environment. We are in a lifestyle of being citizens of a kingdom that's not of this world, and we need to be inducted into that citizenship. But we need to learn it. We need to know what that looks like, what the kingdom language is. Who is the king? What does he want of us? So I start us out with that. Then I go into the Bible because the Bible is the inerrant word of God and it's being attacked. The Bible is being messed with by those who believe in love of God that doesn't punish. Paraphrases are being written that's challenging the essentials of the attributes of God. And those who are even writing it don't realize that they are in disseminating false teaching through how they're interpreting the scripture by translation. And I got to say this, and I bring this out in my book. A, a paraphrase is a one person's commentary. It hasn't been done by multiple checks and challenges and balances, by scholastics, by linguists in the Greek and the Hebrew. It hasn't been accounted for. Now, these individuals writing these paraphrases, they could very well be very good in the Hebrew and the Greek and all that. I'm fine with that. But theology, a person's theology will creep into how they write a verse, what their belief system. And so it's better that you go with a translation that's got committees, that's got teams that uh, you know, cross-referencing and making sure that you've got the, the information that's being presented right. Now, I'm not against paraphrases. Don't take me wrong. But I'm pointing that out. If you're going to be a student of the word, don't build your doctrine on a paraphrase. That can complement. That can confirm. That can kind of bring a little light to it. But the doctrine has to be built on a solid translation Bible. Then I talk about God's natures and attributes. Probably of all the things in this book, that's going to be the most important. Joseph kind of brought that out last night. 
Did you love the way he was talking about the attributes and about holiness and all of that? That's what I bring out one day at a time, one attribute to the next attribute to the next attribute. We have to understand who God is. And that was the funnest part of this book that I wrote. The funnest part. I've been studying the attributes of God for decades. And I love so much. And that's why I introduced it in through Tozer's knowledge of the holy as well. Salvation. What does that really mean? What is original sin? What is grace versus works? What is, what is it about the two trees in the garden anyway? So those kinds of things. The cross of Christ. The high cost that he paid. What does that mean? The church. And I, only, I, I spent a little time on the church, but talking about what are the qualities of a good church? What do you look for in a good church? Because we want disciples to become part of the church in that respect. If they're not already being pulled into a house church group of disciples. Then the spiritual disciplines have a lot of those. Uh, not too many have those, actually. The sacraments are Lord's Supper and water baptism. The Christian walk, I have a lot of those areas. The eternal states, where are we really going? Where are we really going? What is it all about? The eternal states I have in there because of the indoctrination and being infused in the church by many that God is so much love that he will not punish anybody in hell. This world, this life, that's our hell. But God will not punish anybody. And I love how Joseph put that together about love. Discipleship then, now what I'm doing is building you into now preparing this new disciple for discipleship lifestyle. And so I, I address that uh, in about four different lessons and then finally building your library. We have become a nation of sound bites. We've become a generation of just give me a quick little overview instead of teaching people how to study and dig into the word. People are lazy. They say, Pastor, we're paying you to do the digging and the studying. We want you to present to us a great truth, and I will get the soundbite. I will get the, the you know, culmination of your digging and your study, and then I'll take that and enjoy it on Sunday morning. Check that off, and that's the extent of your study in the Lord, in the Word. There's not a challenge in that. But we have to become readers because readers are leaders. And leaders are readers, right? 